In this second chapter about bronchoscopy, I aim to clarify the normal bronchial anatomy. Bronchoscopy at our unit is performed in general anesthesia just before the operation, usually in the anesthetic room and next to the operating room. We introduce the rigid bronchoscope first and then the flexible fiber optic scope through the rigid scope. This arrangement allows precise diagnosis due to the excellent vision with the ability to convert the diagnostic procedure into a therapeutic one should the need arise. There's an old dictum that the eyes will see only what the mind knows. This couldn't be more true than in bronchoscopy. To see the abnormal, the eyes have to be trained to identify the normal. At this stage I'm going to leave you with a one minute normal bronchoscopy and I would encourage you to try and name the bronchial divisions as we go along. The screen will be divided into two halves. The left half, with the black background, will show the bronchoscopic steps of a continuous clip of normal bronchoscopy, whereas the right grey half of the screen points out what to look for, alternating with a real-time map of the anatomy of what is seen on the left side. As a quick reminder, the general arrangement of what we are after is a single main stem trachea dividing into two lobar bronchi representing the first level of division. The main lobar bronchi divide into segmental bronchi representing the second level of division. Up to the level of the segmental bronchi the anatomy doesn't change much but when it comes to the subsegmental and the third level of division the anatomy isn't so constant. Despite the fact that the operator could negotiate the slender 5mm scope Beyond the third level of divisions, the thoracic surgeon possibly has no great interest in that level of detail. Now let us examine in detail how this one minute bronchoscopy was reported. The anesthetist usually pre oxygenates the patient using 100% oxygen for a couple of minutes to give the operator a trouble free 2 to 3 minutes complete apnea to introduce the rigid bronchoscope. To avoid injury to the patient's teeth, the rigid scope should be resting and fulcruming on the operator's thumb. This is mimicked to the movement of a cue stick when striking the cue ball in snooker or billiard. As soon as the illuminated rigid bronchoscope is introduced behind the tongue, the operator is encouraged to start looking through the scope, keeping the scope dead in the median line. The next step is crucial to entering the trachea, so pay particular attention to it. Lifting up the posterior third of the tongue exposes the epiglottis. Next, the bevel of the rigid scope is introduced for a centimeter or so under the epiglottis and the latter is lifted up while keeping the scope in the median line. Note that this is a blind move. If the epiglottis is lifted successfully, it will not be seen again. Sometimes the epiglottis is very floppy and difficult to lift up. However, this is a crucial step and if the epiglottis isn't identified or not lifted up successfully, you should not proceed. Go back one step and try again. To my mind, identifying and lifting the epiglottis is the main cause of failure to introduce the bronchoscope by interns and trainees. Once the epiglottis is lifted and the scope is advanced for a couple of millimeters, the vocal cords should come into view. The operator should make note of the abnormalities of the epiglottis, vocal cords and the larynx. This should be reported to the ear, nose and throat surgeons for advice or follow-up, preferably with a photo of the abnormality. Here are some anatomical landmarks to help you describe anomalies to your ENT colleagues. With good muscle relaxation, the cords are seen to be abducted or abducted away from the median line and stationary. The rigid scope is then turned 90 degrees to the right before introducing it via the cords. This maneuver aligns the shortest diameter of the tip of the scope transversely to avoid damage to the cords. Once in the trachea, the Venturi device is connected to the rigid scope to establish ventilation. The operator can now relax and pay attention to introducing the flexible scope through the rigid one to examine the central airways. Once the vocal cords are passed, we enter into the larynx. This air box is kept open at all times by a number of cartilages and membranes. We will only see the mucosal covering of these structures from the inside, but landmarks of the thyroid and the cricoid cartilages are noted. The ferrous cartilaginous ring of the trachea is the cricoid cartilage, 
and it is the only complete ring. The cricothyroid membrane is the landmark for introducing a mini track or injecting local anesthetic. The true trachea starts distal to the cricoid cartilage. The C-shaped trachea rings are noted to dent the mucosa. In the adult there are 18 to 22 rings. Roughly each two rings are equivalent to 1 cm and the length of the trachea is about 12 to 18 cm in the adult male and it is shorter in the female. The adult male trachea has a diameter of 2.5 cm and the female has a smaller diameter of 2 cm. This guide is useful when considering tracheal stent size. The normal trachea has a D-shaped cross-section. The architecture of the scaffolding of the trachea is preserved by the C-shaped cartilages which form what is known as the cathedral arches. The trachealis muscle forms the membranous part of the trachea and show as longitudinal mucosal folds that make the flooring under the cathedral arches. The membranous part completes the circumference of the trachea and closes the C into a D profile. As the scope is further advanced and the lower orifices come into light, we tend to notice the bronchial orifices first. In this video I aim to change this taboo or basic instinct of seeing bronchial orifices first and replace it with a new concept of thinking and seeing carina first. To my mind, identifying the proper level of carini is the secret to diagnostic bronchoscopy. But for now, let us identify the sharp main carina or C1. This is the first level of bronchial division and it divides the trachea into right and left main stem bronchi. The question arises here as whether we should examine the right or the left bronchial tree first. The principle is to examine the normal side first. Because if the disease side is examined first, this might cause bleeding, which we might regret. It might either prevent complete examination of the airways, or worse still, dictate drastic measures to stop the bleeding and abandon the original plan of resection. Next, we will examine the right main bronchus. This is a short 2 to 3 cm bronchus in vertical continuity with the main trachea. To define its territory precisely, we have to define its inlet and outlet. These two rings are defined by thinking and seeing carina first. We have already defined the primary carina, C1, which defines the inlet of the right main bronchus. The outlet is defined by the secondary carina, or C2, between the right upper lobe and the bronchus intermedius. Practically, the right main bronchus spans the surface area from carina to carina, i.e. from C1 to C2. The concept of carina to carina will repeat itself in this video several times. As the scope turns to negotiate the segmental orifices of the bronchi, the scope was turned 90 degrees to the right and the takeoff of the right upper lobe could be seen at 3 o'clock. On advancing the scope further down the right main bronchus, one is greeted by the Mercedes-Benz sign which helps identification of the right upper lobe bronchus. The latter divides into three segmental bronchi, apical bronchus, also known as RB1, posterior or RB2, and anterior or RB3. R stands for right and B stands for bronchus. Remember, this is the third level of division. A common variant of the normal is four divisions instead of three. The anterior segment bronchus, RB3, divides early into two subsegmental bronchi, giving the impression of four divisions. If we follow the rule of seeing the carina first, it becomes clear which carina is C3 and which one is C4, and that gives it away. Another common variant is the two divisions soon branching into three bronchi. In the example shown, the anterior and posterior segments share a common orifice. Identification of these abnormal orifices can be confusing, and I usually go back to scrutinize the CT scan to tally with the bronchoscopic findings. On the CT scan, in this case, the upper lobe bronchus is seen foreshortened all the way down to its origin from the right main bronchus. Then, the anterior and posterior bronchi are seen branching from a common stem. 
We now move on to examine the bronchus intermedius. Again, we need to define its territory precisely by defining its inlet and outlet, making use of the principle of carina to carina. To that end, we will first mark the secondary carina between the upper lobe and the bronchus intermedius, which marks the inlet and the tertiary carina that separates the middle from the lower lobe, which marks the outlet of the bronchus intermedius. The bronchus intermedius is practically the surface area from carina to carina. If the scope is turned 90 degrees to the left to align the primary carina vertically, then the floor of the bronchus intermedius is seen to be made of the membranous part. As a rule of thumb, the ridges of the membranous part will always lead us to the lower lobe. In this vertical axis, note is made of three bronchial orifices. The middle lobe at 12 o'clock, the apical segment of the lower lobe at 6 o'clock, and the common basal bronchus in between. Because it is difficult to align the three bronchi in this vertical axis, the bronchus intermedius is usually examined in the horizontal plane, having turned the scope 90 degrees to the right. I hope by now we got used to the habit of seeing carina ferrous. If so, let's identify the tertiary carina between middle and lower lobe. Also make note of the next level of division, the quaternary carina between apical lower and common basal segments of the lower lobe. It's of paramount importance to appreciate the hierarchy of the carini and appreciate the higher or proximal origin of the tertiary carina in relation to the quaternary carina. We will start by examining the middle lobe bronchus, which divides into two segmental bronchi, the lateral or RB4 and the medial RB5. Next we will move to the common basal segments of the right lower lobe. One should expect a crescent of three orifices separated by a sharp carina from a single orifice facing its concavity. These four orifices are named in a clockwise order as medial basal RB7, anterior basal RB8, lateral basal RB9 and posterior basal RB10. Divisions of the common basal segments show great variation, the commonest being absence of RB7 and two sets of double divisions as shown here. On proximal withdrawal of the scope, the takeoff of the apical segment of RB6 should be seen separated by a sharp quaternary carina from the common basal segments. This concludes examination of the right side of the tracheobronchial tree. The scope is withdrawn back just above the carina in preparation to engage the left main bronchus. The left main bronchus is longer than the right and spans 5 to 6 cm and attains a more horizontal orientation. To define the territory of the left main bronchus, we will follow the same principles as before. We have to define the inlet and outlet by identifying the related carini. The inlet and primary carina are known to us, and one could see at the far end the secondary carina C2 between the upper and lower lobes. C2 defines the outlet of the left main bronchus, and the surface area from carina to carina makes up the left main stem. On introducing the scope further down the left main, we first make note of the sharp secondary carina C2 between left, upper and lower lobe orifices. Also note the more distal origin of the tertiary carini, which divide the segmental bronchi. The membranous part, as always, will lead us into the lower lobe orifice. This is an important sign, and I find it very helpful when confused about orientation. On advancing the scope into the upper lobe bronchus, note is made of the carini ferris to define inlet and outlet. Here again, the surface area from carina to carina makes up the upper lobe bronchus. On approaching the upper lobe divisions, it's important to identify the tertiary carina, C3, between upper divisions and lingula. On advancing the scope into the upper division, again we look for the quaternary carina, which divides the apico-posterior segmental bronchi, LB1 and 2, and the anterior segmental bronchus, LB3.
The scope is then introduced into the lingula to expose the two segmental divisions, the superior LB4 and the inferior LB5. Before examining the lower lobe, let us examine some variation of the left upper lobe. In fact, this is a good example of how carinal recognition plays a crucial part in resolving confusion. On the right screen, the upper lobe is showing three divisions instead of two. The middle one is confusing. Should we call it superior segmental of the lingula, LB4, or anterior segmental of the upper division, LB3? Only when deciding where is the tertiary carina, the anatomy becomes clearer. C3, which divides the upper division or trisegment from the lingula, is higher and more proximal than the next level in the hierarchy of carinae, in this case C4. Subsequently, the upper left orifice has to be the upper division or trisegment, and everything else is the lingula, and that makes the middle orifice part of the lingula, i.e. LB4. This becomes even clearer when the view is magnified and the hierarchy of the carinae is well established. This is another example highlighting the same problem. The left upper lobe has three divisions and the middle one is a dilemma. It could be LB4, superior segment of the lingula, or LB3, the anterior segment of the upper division. The deciding factor will be proper identification of the carinae. It will be noted here that this is the higher or more proximal tertiary carina C3 compared to the lower or more distal quaternary carina C4. This clearly divides the lingula from the upper division and the middle orifice certainly in this example belongs to the upper division. Therefore it has to be LB3. Again this is made clearer when zooming on to enlarge the origin of the carina. The scope is then retracted before being introduced into the left lower lobe. Once more, note is made of the secondary and tertiary carinae to define inlet and outlet of the lower lobe bronchus. The space from carina to carina is appreciated as that of the left lower lobe bronchus. Like the right side, the left lower lobe retains the structure of an apical segment and common basal parts. The apical segment is known as LB6 and usually divides into three subsegmental bronchi. We now know that the medial segment, or LB7, is squashed and is usually missing in the normal arrangement. Therefore, one would expect to see three divisions, the anterior, LB8, lateral, LB9, and the posterior, or LB10. The commonest variation to the common basal segments is two divisions as shown in this example. And sometimes the medial basal or LB7 persists. This concludes examination of normal airways and in the next chapter we will deal with abnormal bronchoscopies and decision taking.